All right, all right. How are we doing today? Good. He's in here. I like the setup you got there. It's nice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. DIY mic, by the way. I built it. Yeah, I don't have a uh, fancy. What is that? Like a. Uh, it's not a Yeti. Like you. Oh, no. This is a. This is a custom that... mic. Oh, my God. You have to show me how you built that. For sure. I just copied this YouTuber's like bill of materials and then i had to get some kind of creative but it was like my project for the second semester of last year and it made me want to die i would imagine so after uh going through signals and systems myself oh it was yeah analog systems oh that's what i'm going through now Woo! <clears throat> Uh should probably share this. Let me know if you guys can see it. I can see it. Cool. We'll wait a little bit for people to trickle in. Uh yeah, I'm recording through OBS because zooms encoding kind of sucks so it'll be recorded in high quality 1440p There we go.
What's up, Dar? What's up? Hey, what's up, Zach? What's up, Salvador? Nice caption. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> How's my uh, microphone volume? Is it low? Pretty good to me. Same here. Gotcha. I'll try to keep my voice constant. All right, we'll get started at like 2.10, 2.15. See if there's any more people who are going to show up. Where are these officers, man? Bad showing. They might be, they might be uh, counting on uh, watching their recording. Oh, uh, yeah. Squares. I'm going to have to <laughs> cut that out of the recording. <laughs> we do have busy lives, you know. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Man, you got COVID and you still showed up. Oh, what's <laughs> up, Kaya? <laughs> yeah. I was just talking shit. <laughs> Oh, you guys want to see my new soccer bot real quick? Let me launch SolidWorks. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Right. Here it is. Uh, I still have to color it and everything, but it should be one pound lighter. That's pretty impressive uh, weight drop. Yeah, it's these damn motors, man. The Vex motors are so heavy for no reason. I was looking at uh, BattleBots motors actually for ant weight. And they put yeah. out like more power than these Vex motors for a quarter of the weight. And so I'm kind of regretting are they my decision cheaper? to spend. <laughs> no, Vex motors are like way more expensive. I guess maybe a brand name? Yeah. At they best. come with a, uh, a pretty torquey ratio in them. So they're good for like heavy lifting applications and not like drive motor. But. Which is entirely a soccer bot for me. It's just so. Yeah. yeah Back no, to I the get... drawing boards after this one. Let me 
can take a look at. You probably already saw this, but this is what my battle bot, the layout is going to look like. We'll go over all this stuff in the upcoming weeks. What's like the front yellow part for? Oh, this is a weapon. It's a beauty oh, bar. Nice. Uh, we actually have a... Uh, oh, okay. Players. That whole thing spins. That makes sense, yeah. Yep. In today's nice. presentation, we'll go over uh, some weapon decisions that you might make when you design a battle bot. Right, right. But yeah, belts in SolidWorks, not fun, as it turns out. <laughs> All right. Okay, appears we have an imposter in here. <laughs> Mark is going to uh, start Mark Angelo Lahano. Everyone say hi. This is going to be the battle bots for Sac State. He said he didn't know if he was going to start it, but since I'm putting him on the spot now, and now that I have witnesses, he has to. Oh, yay. Yeah, I'm here to represent um, Sac State. <laughs> I'm trying to get him. I'm trying to get him so that we could have a yeah. grudge match. I'll see if I can fit it in my schedule. So Sac, <clears throat> Sac State is the community college uh, next to us? Oh, no. Uh, it's a NorCal CSU. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. a CSU in um in Sacramento. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, I'm thinking of Mount Sac. We have Yeah. Yeah. I uh... similar. Similar names. How is it how is it up there in Sacramento right now? That's all right. Kind of hot right now. Um busy, busy, really really big city. Skyscrapers and all that. So it's like uh, you know, tons of people. Oh yeah. Hey bro, I'm I'm from NorCal. Hey Kai, where are you from? Santa Rosa, damn. I actually don't know if I've been to Santa Rosa. Maybe I have. I don't I don't come from uh, NorCal, but I did go there for a vacation uh, right before the semester started. Me, Mark, and Taylor are actually all from like the same place. We're from like the, the Northern Bay area. Oh, really? Yeah. I probably drove right by you guys then. <laughs> Most likely. We're a drive through town. Are you guys uh, relatively close to the coast? I assume. Eh, not really. Still... You, but you're, but you're a bay. Yeah, but I mean, the coast that we're close to isn't. I mean, you just go to like the river delta, and then you're in the bay. It's not. Yeah. Bad. My place is next to to like uh ocean. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. All right, well, we got yeah. a good showing today. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. All right, combat robotics. Welcome to the first Battle Pots workshop. We're going to be learning how to build robots that destroy other robots uh, in a martial arts style competition. Today, we're going to go over uh, how to understand what we're doing because that's going to be a key part in 
the design of your robots. So first things first, my name is Zachary Johnson. I'm a fourth year MSET major. I'm going to be out of here in the spring, hopefully. Uh, never know, but you know. I competed in FRC, VEX, FLL. I've been doing competitive robotics since I was like in sixth grade. Uh, I traded entirely my social skills for the ability to build robots like every other month pretty much. And you can see some of my previous robot projects. Uh, my soccer bot is in the bottom left there. Here it is right here. Not sure if you can see it. Um, it's currently three pounds, which is one pound over the two pound weight limit. So that's why I just showed you my, my other design. And its controller is right here. It's a universal controller. It'll be controlling all my robots pretty much. Uh, on the right here, we have my FRC robot for my senior year. We made it to Worlds. Pretty cool, pretty snazzy. And there is one of my VEX robots, one of like six. I can't even remember all of them. But yeah, I've been all around the world. Not the world, actually. I've been all around the U.S., Kentucky, Texas, uh, Kansas for uh, robotics competitions. Fun times. Hope I can teach you a lot. And I'm uh, Chase Ashley. I'm a third-year electrical engineer. I'll be the co-lead for this project. I have uh, s some robotics experience from First Robotics, during high school and we basically I'm my team made it all the way to regionals albeit I don't think we did as well as Zach over here <laughs> ah don't worry it's all about the it's all about competing not about how far you get it's true it's true but uh aside from robotics I'm also a bit of a history buff by love buying art and TV and games and I have uh, multiple dogs Unfortunately, I didn't have a good photo of the upper one, but this is Mitch over here. So, cool dog, cool dog. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, to keep things interesting, I'm going to run some YouTube videos uh, in between. 60 seconds left in this match, and both of these weapons are going. Both of their drive is going. Wow. Big uh, can you turn the sound on? Uh, oh god. Yeah, it might be it might be the YouTube player itself. Oh sure so. There we go. Yeah, both of these bots have been uh, survived being launched across the box by these powerful kinetic weapons multiple times during this match. Just really a testament to the build quality of these bots. 40 seconds left. This is WPI versus WPI action at its best. David Jin versus Brian Boxel. Wow. I don't think these bots are gonna quit, Kyle. You mean croak? These bots are gonna croak, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So what you saw there were three pound beetle bots. 60 uh, three pound beetle bots at a fairly high level. Actually, that was, um, I believe it was like the finals bracket of whatever competition they were there for. And that was WPI, which is like a notorious robotics institution for any competitive robotics. And those are, that is actually a design that I'm personally trying to emulate is Polywog, which was the, not the red one. But you can see what these matches sort of start to look like. That aluminum box, by the way, was the referee. If you get tapped by that box, uh, it's a tap out. You are, it's a, you're knocked out pretty much. But combat robotics as a entire encapsulated sport is a subset of competitive robotics where the focus is to disable an opponent's robot, usually through destructive means. It's split into weight classes and the win condition is similar to martial arts. There are tap outs, count outs, and if both robots are left standing at the end of a timeout, uh, it's up to the judges uh, to, and usually these judges award wins based on whoever the most aggressive driver was. I do want to say uh, specifically uh, for the UCLA bot competition we will be doing, 
last uh last year they had it so whichever bot did the most damage at essentially that's how the judges judged it specifically gotcha As for what we will be doing, uh, the overall goal in this project will be to conceptualize, design, spec, build, and perhaps even compete with a robot. We will be designing these robots within the constraints of their weight class. We're going to start with ant weights, and once we get a sufficient experience in the design process, we're going to move to working with beetle bots, uh, or beetle weight bots. So that's one pound for the ant, weight, ant weights, three pounds for the beetle weights. We will get used to using industry standard tools, software, specifications, and design philosophy, really. Doing it this way will give you the best chance to create a effective and cool robot, and you can shamelessly put these tools in your resume, and you won't be lying about it, really. As far as the constraints for ant weights, which is where we're going to start, one pound weight limit, no size restriction, there is a technicality where your uh, radio receiver on the bot has to fail safe pretty much uh, your robots have to be de-energized if you lose radio connection uh, mid-match there's going to be competition specific rules usually um, as Chase mentioned previously with UCLA there's uh, probably some nuances that we have to pay attention to and projectiles are not allowed. We confirmed this actually before we met today. Flamethrowers are allowed, but uh, you're not allowed to build them uh, in this club. <laughs> yeah. So specifically for the ant weights, we'll likely be doing it in-house. And projectiles very much just pose too much of a threat. Uh, even at the ant weight level, you still have to have a quarter inch of bulletproof glass with two, well, two, two sheets of it with air in between, between, just to make sure you're safe. So, we don't want to add any additional variables that could uh, possibly get someone killed. Yeah, we're doing our best to try to make a good impression with uh, everybody involved here, so we can keep this sort of program running for the club. Uh, and people getting injured is definitely like one way to for sure get us shut down. So we're gonna we're gonna play it, you know, safe. And uh, let's look at some ant weight fights. Begin. Contact was made. So begin. Begin. We're supposed to leave one of them. Isaac takes it. Begin. It goes. As you can see, not as glamorous as the beetle weights, but there's definitely their own. There's definitely some design uh, issues that you run into with one pound weight limits. You're, you're not allowed to get as creative as you are with the three pound, but it's still competitive. And if it seems kind of lame to you, just wait till you start to design some of these bots. It gets pretty complex. Begin. All right, let's talk about. What the hell is going on in uh, BattleBots right now? The metagame. There's already a developed design ethos in BattleBots. There's 
established designs, established ideas that work because people have done them over decades now. Uh, people have found out what works, what doesn't, and what counters what. It's constantly evolving though, and competitions from like five, six years ago look completely different than what's going on now. As far as what drives innovation is uh, material with materials with improved characteristics becoming affordable or becoming more widespread really. Uh, enhanced electronic systems. Uh, a notable example of this is brushless motors on drives. These used to be kind of a thing reserved for teams that had deeper pockets or better machinery. But now you can just buy brushless parts off the, off the internet and you can have a competitive bot. Let's get down to the metagame uh, designs. We have Wedge. Uh, left to right is up to down. So Wedge is the left one here. Uh, it's that little one with just a ramp pretty much. It's just a robot which drives around. It has a ramp and it tries to flip or damage through kinetic means the opponent. We have the beater bar, which is that if you see this little gold thing at the front of this, uh, it spins up really fast and it's it hits other robots with the screws that are tapped into it. Uh, this is a by far probably one of the more popular weapons that you'll see, just because it's pretty easy to set up and it's it's effective. It's uh, renowned for its reliability and effectiveness. We have the horizontal spinner, which is pretty common with uh, kit robots, so you'll probably see this a lot as well. It just consists of a uh, Usually an AR-500 steel uh, circle with barbs in it. it spins up pretty fast and it has a tendency to launch robots uh, horizontally, which is pretty effective, I guess. I haven't seen actually much of them in combat. And you have vertical spinners. Uh, these, This is another uh, pretty common one. It's just a horizontal spinner, but vertical this time. Usually has a wedge. There are also... Well, there are also some other oddball designs out there. Uh, if you watch any, we'll actually go over one pretty weird design uh, later on. But it's hard to it's hard to engineer these oddball designs, and there's a lot of uh, documentation on these specific designs already, which is why they're called like the meta game. So on to more design philosophy things. Um, you should learn when to innovate and when to take inspiration. There's no such thing as copying at your level because by the time you're done building, designing, uh, specking everything, once you're assembling it, what you'll have is essentially a unique design because the difference in skill level between what you're copying and what you're building will make it so that you'll have to use different processes and different uh, sort of design logic in order to get to the same place. And tried and true designs are tried and true for a reason. There's no reason why you should reinvent the wheel, as the last slide said, because you'll have a better time when you know what to work with and you're working with something that is well documented. Do not copy a kit from online because it'll be less effective and it'll be lame. I'm just, I'm going to teach you how to design a robot from the ground up. So there's no reason for you to really go online and find all the CAD files for a kit and then just put it in your bill of materials and then try to get me to buy it. Uh, I want you guys to build a robot that is almost entirely your own, or actually it will be entirely your own design because that's the spirit of the sport. If you have an original idea though, always do some research if it already has been developed or if there's a similar concept floating around. Because usually if someone has a problem, it's like a guarantee that they've complained about it on Reddit and somebody has replied with the solution. So there's no reason for you to stress out. Just look it up um, or ask me or the Discord and you'll get a good answer. There's no reason why we should be, I don't know making something that is entirely 100% coming out of our mind. We should be consulting other people and other designs because they work. They work and there's no reason not to use them.
uh, let's go ahead look at uh, the internals of a pretty good ant weight. This guy is actually known for making some pretty good robotics, uh, more techno technical uh, battle bot videos. The first thing I needed to do was to disassemble Sergeant Cuddles and get to the drive motor so I could start replacing some components and really seeing what all the damage was. This is um, what Cuddles looked like right after the Robo Games competition and he was pretty beat up and had some damage here and there. Um, as you can see the top armor is pretty well chipped up and I'm going to go through and replace a lot of these components with new ones that were damaged. So once we get inside, you can see the old way of holding the motors in place. Um, they just have these um, laser cut tabs that are cut out of, I think it's like quarter inch or three eighths inch acrylic, and they were just kind of glued in place. And on the very first big hit, they would just get knocked loose and then the motors would rise up a little bit and the wheels would no longer make contact with the ground. So that was a really big problem. I really did like that the motors were just kind of press fit in place, that was good. That really um, helped things out so that they kind of absorb the impact um, in the UHMW frame, but I need a better way to secure them in place. I'm also taking out the drum here. Um, I'm gonna end up switching chassis. I have a backup chassis that was in better condition. I just wanted to start out the competition with a nice fresh um, selection of parts here. So. Um, taking the drum out and getting the motor out and there's also a big chunk in the side of the motor taken out so I wanted to replace that just in case. Um, the drum itself is actually relatively difficult to get out which is kind of a, a nice design feature. It really just kind of presses in there and you have to bend the frame to get it in there so it's really hard to knock that weapon loose and do any real damage to it. So that was kind of nice. And here's ultimately what Sergeant Cuddles looks like in component form. You can see all the screws, the two little motor holder thingies, the frame, the drum with the motor, the electronics, and then the armor. Um, so that's really all there is to it. Um, so let's go modify the frames. Look at it. It's beautiful. It's so simple, and it works. This guy wins competitions. Notable is that this uh, his weapon design is actually all original. Uh, he machined it himself. Pretty interesting stuff. If any of you know how to use a mill, uh, hit me up because I have some <laughs> orders to make. So Taylor asked in chat, is that all PLA? I'm assuming the first he's looking... Uh, which one? Uh, what side are you talking about, Taylor? Oh, the Antway video? Yeah, there's definitely, uh, I think the blue ones, the blue robots were definitely PLA just because of how like stringy it got and like how like brittle it looked. PLA is not the 3D printing material that you guys are going to use if you have 3D printed parts. You're going to use PETG probably just because it has uh, more of a ductile, ductile strength to it rather than PLA's sort of brittle hardness. It has its uses, but it's in combat robotics, uh, ductility and strength is much more preferred. And on that topic, uh, here we have a video or a slide for mechanical engineers currently here. Uh, keep it simple, uh, stupid. It may be attempting to immediately try and shoot for uh, the stars in terms of design, but as you saw from the last video, don't have to. Uh, exotic build materials and multi-linkage parts are an example of these concepts that are probably too complex for your first foray into compact combat robotics. It would be to your benefit if you just focused on one particular aspect for your ant weight design, like the drivetrain. If you want to build a wedge, which is the robot that is just a drivetrain with a little like scoop, if you want to build that, that is perfect because all you're going to do is you're going to focus on engineering your drivetrain, engineering your chassis. You don't have to worry about a weapon. Uh, you don't have to worry about gyroscopic moments. You don't have to worry about wear through extended cycles. Because you need to get a proper idea of what designing the simple stuff is like. Because once you know how, you walk, how to walk, you can run. And running is going to be designing your beetle weight where I'm going to try to push you to add weapons to your robot um 
something not particularly hard, but uh, a weapon because that's what BattleBots is. That's what it's about. And as far as designing, uh, you need to split things up into small tasks. You shouldn't be like, today I'm going to 3D, or, or today I'm going to design my chassis uh, in SolidWorks. Because that's that's like a, a multi-week project in order to really flesh that design out, get your ideas uh, actually out onto a file. You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. You want to take it easy. You want to do just one simple task, like maybe every week. So that way, by the end of it, you have a cumulative knowledge of your robot. For your e for you EEs out here, there's no PCB design in combat robotics at this size and format. There's very little need to add Arduinos to your own circuit designs. And this is like the only robotics experience that I've ever come across so far where the EEs are going to be doing more hands-on like uh, like screw like you know like tool work and the MEs are going to be more conceptual so harness building is going to be your pinnacle task it's designing the wires and connecting all the boards the motor drivers Transmitter, receiver, managing radio, stuff like that. Uh, hobbyist technical knowledge is more emphasized than higher ed design. Uh, where you're not going to be really designing your own circuits. You're mostly going to be soldering connections, making sure it goes to the right terminal. So, to demonstrate this, I want to pose a question. Uh, you have just blown up a motor driver board after driving four brushless or four brushed motors full speed and then stopping. It is found that no mechanical failure or external factors contributed to this failure. It was entirely due to the electrical systems mentioned in this prompt. What happened and how do you fix it? I'll give you guys like a few minutes to think about it. If you have a guess, go ahead. It's it's not immediately obvious, but if any of you have actually worked on electrical systems for robots, there's like maybe a 1 in 100 chance you know what's going on here. It's deliberately obtuse, this question, so don't worry if you don't fully understand it. Would it be something like, um, like uh, too much current going through the board or something from stopping too quickly? Pretty close. Um, I won't say anything. I mean, you're not wrong, but there's a there's a nuanced sort of hobbyist electronics knowledge that's being demonstrated here. And the answer is backfeeding motors. Brushed motors love to send noisy ass electricity back through the motor drivers, and this is like one of the most common reasons why people fry uh, motor controllers because current's only supposed to flow through that MOSFET one way and if it comes back it'll just burn straight through the gate so how you would fix it is you would attach a small capacitor usually like 0 0.2 microfarad between the terminals of the brush motors what this will do is it'll filter the uh, current so that way you're not getting so much wavy uh, backflow it's just something to think oh, about. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess when you stop it, like the entire magnetic field just collapses and sends the current back. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's chaos. Uh, I've definitely like destroyed a few Arduinos doing that. Uh, it's not not a fun time, uh, and it'll go straight through the signal wire too. So, yeah. Oh shit. Fun time. <laughs> fun times. Uh, for UCS and CE majors, I'm sorry. There's like not much need for uh, code execution on a robot there are robots that do have it and they're extremely complex designs and intricate if you're up for it knock yourselves out i believe you can do it uh bots that do rely on like complex sensor input and onboard processing have designs that necessitate it many use arduino for simple logic with leds but it's cool but it's i mean this is not something that you probably just want to do you probably want to do something that's a little bit more 
difficult or flexes your, I don't know, your C muscles, I guess. I encourage any of you who are in these computer majors uh, to get creative or leave your comfort zone. Pick up SolidWorks and learn some 3D design. Go deeper into hobbyist electronics and do EE stuff. That's pretty common. Uh, but if you're like cracked and you're some sort of god Google intern who knows C, like the back of your hand, and you want to do some uh, crazy sensor and computing, uh, let me know because I want you on my team. Uh, speaking of these robots that have onboard computing and sensor, let's look at Project Liftoff. It's a, it's this white robot here that spins up really fast. Editors. Yep. Oh, All right, here we go. That my starts the timer. goodness. Four, three. Let's get hype. One. Five. Ooh, Project Liftoff attempting to get up to speed. Judges oh. Dream doing everything it can to not let that happen. Stay on top of them, Judges Dream. That is your hope. That is how you win this fight. Do not let them get up to full speed. Oh! You can see Hunter is uh, not even running his weapon. There is no purpose there. I wonder if the weapon is down on Judge's Dream. Yeah, or if he's just saving it. Now you will know that uh, Project Liftoff has died because he's oh. not running. What is that? The snake has not made yeah, it. that was the snake, and that is not a snake anymore. Wow. Friendly fire from Project Liftoff. Cold blooded. Cold blooded indeed. Oh, that was all folders. Yep. All right. So the computing that goes on here is uh, since Project Liftoff or this white, like, top spinning robot is called a melty brain, where the entire robot spins, it has a. Uh, I think it's an Arduino uh, inside that filters driver input so that it provides uh, it it basically modulates the spinning motors or the drive motors in such a way that even while it's in a spinning uh, reference frame it could still move in space this is by like adjusting the power of the motor at certain points in the cycle in the spin cycle so when it's at top speed it could actually like move around like the field pretty well uh and so that's if you know how to do that, uh, you're crazy. And it's worth a shot because Project Liftoff also like wins tournaments like often <laughs> because it's just so hard to kill. All right, on to tried and true parts. I spent like a ton of days uh, looking at suppliers and seeing what everybody else is buying. And so the answer is that there's a well-developed market for this kind of stuff. There's a ma major intersection with hobby drone building, and there's some intersection with other competitive robotics. Most of these parts are already in CAD, so you're you won't have to like CAD each motor or anything. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't do that. That would be ridiculously time-consuming. Uh, there are pr plenty of Reddit and forum posts about performance characteristics of certain parts uh, and what to use and while I don't necessarily agree with some of them, I mean, people do use them and they work. Always consult Reddit and other forums regarding building battle bots because they'll always have answers. It goes back to what I said before. Uh, if someone has had a problem before, they've probably complained about it on Reddit. So it's worth looking up to see uh, if some solution was uh, offered. You can see some of examples of parts that are commonly used in battle bots. On the left is a lipo battery. It'll you're going to be using a lipo battery that looks like this uh, in your bot, anyways. Uh, neoprene wheels, which are you know like a default wheel for robots. Uh, this is a silver spark. If you're going to use a brush motor in your design, uh, which I, for ant weights, it's like a given uh, that you're going to. You're going to use either the one on the left here or the one on the right. The one on the right is not better uh but cheaper and faster i don't uh, i don't know but um yeah you're going to be using these parts there's already like dictated boundaries of what you can use to be competitive 
and it makes your life a lot easier because you're not engineering from the ground up. As far as suppliers, if you want to take a look at your look at it yourself, uh, Finger Tech Robotics is going to be your general parts store. Uh, it'll it's a good place to look for ideas. They have like um, a beater bar kit, which is a it's a it's a weapon. It's what it, uh, we went over it earlier. Uh, they have like kits for like certain weapons, so it's really good if you want to use a weapon but you have no idea where to start. Using these pre-built kits are for weapons and stuff like that. It's good. Uh, Rectified Robotics is for specialized electronics. Uh, they are they make the brushless drive motors in my Beetleweight, or they will. Uh, I still have to buy them. But they're meant for like they make stuff for more higher performance. Uh, if we do Beetlebots, it'll you'll probably take a look at them, see if you want to use it, uh, use their stuff. Hobby King is where you're gonna buy your lipos, or you're gonna look for your lipos actually, not buy them. Um, and they have some cool transmitter and receiver stuff. And Banebots, Banebots is a specialized robotics company i guess i don't know they have a uh, competitive robotics team too they make good wheels they make awesome wheels uh which i'm going to suggest that you use but i'll explain more of that uh probably next friday they make very expensive motors uh which you won't use because they're heavy but they're good um All right, as far as like what you're going to be doing in the near future, you're going to be staring at spreadsheets, uh, designing a robot on paper and in your brain, because most design mistakes can be effectively avoided if uh, you properly design your robot on paper first without just buying parts. Before even opening SolidWorks, uh, having an airtight and verbose bill of materials is critical, absolutely critical. Um, you might hate me for like nagging you for making like you know like update your bill of materials update your bill of materials build your robot on paper but it allows you to build a robot immediately um after you have done thinking uh you just do all of your thinking like before you start building so that way when you get to assembly you're just like fitting a kit together that you pretty much made and it's way more rewarding when everything works like the first time and that's what a bill of materials is for by the time it comes to acquire the parts, you will likely know the robot back to front, and it makes CADing so much easier. Uh, you don't have to do any guesswork. It's just, it's like putting together Legos. It's also the first sanity check that your perspective design is below the weight limit, because you could budget weight in your bill of materials. You don't have to worry about, like, a week before competition, like, drilling holes into your uh, robot. As a big thing in first robotics that we did. <laughs> and here's my bill of materials for my beetle weight. Uh, a snapshot. It's been updated a little bit uh, recently, but yeah, this is what it's. This is what we're going to be working on pretty much. I highlighted all the suppliers uh, so that way requisitions doesn't get mad at me for sending them on a rat race. Or actually, I'm going to be buying them, so that's not too big of a deal. But yeah, notes, make sure you guys, I budgeted my weight, so that allowed me to see that, hey, I have 557 grams left for my chassis, and that's going to cost more money. Uh, you could also, uh, we'll, we'll, look, we'll talk about that later. Um, so... In conclusion, bringing it back, BattleBots, competitive robotic sport where you're trying to kill the other robot. It's split into weight, uh, weight classes and it has a metagame that we should be following. Ant weight is a one pound weight class which we're going to be designing for uh, in these early stages of the workshops. Parts, there are already established suppliers and you should be looking to design with their parts. And as far as design philosophy, we're going to be designing on paper first moving to SOLIDWORKS, and then maybe assembling. What we need to do, uh, we need to start gathering more project-specific info, so what parts you may use, putting together a bill of materials, 
uh, gathering CAD files, stuff like that. Uh, brainstorming ideas or designs. Uh, look online if you if you really want to get sweaty, try hard. Go ahead, look on design, online at other YouTube videos, and see if you want to take inspiration from some somebody's robot. Uh, understand some things that might be unrealistic for you to make. Some things are probably going to be difficult to manufacture and or too complex to effectively design in the time period that we have. And that'll be it today. If you have any questions, go ahead. So for the first ones, are all majors basically kind of going through all parts of the build, I guess. Uh, say that again? So for the first, like for the lightweight ones, um, is it like, okay, so I'm an EE major and there's like a mechanical engineering major, but we all kind of design and use SOLIDWORKS and build it, or is it kind of divided into different parts or? Um, it's up to you guys to decide really, but uh, it should be collaborative along the way, certainly. Um, you don't just because you're an EE doesn't mean you can't pick up SolidWorks. Right, right. For sure. Uh, and just because they're an ME should also know about the electrical systems that are going on board so that way they know how to design stuff like that. But for the lightweight ones, certainly. Uh, kind yeah. of like an inclusive thing to like learn a little bit about everything. Right? Yeah. And you kind of have like a timeline or like how kind of a rough plan of how is it like this so it'll go along this semester right yep uh ant wait we're looking to be um by the end of the semester we're already looking to be done uh with ant okay, cool. uh so that way we can we want to i want to get you guys used to designing yeah um or actually we want to we want to get you guys like perfectly comfortable with combat robotics and then we can go into building ant weights get your feet wet in ant weight cool okay that way we don't kill ourselves using doing the beta weight exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah yeah the cost shoots up tremendously from there right right i'd imagine Any other questions? Uh, just remind me real quick. So the Antway would be like individual and then the other ones would be like, you could go for like a team or something or? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, well, I... Antweight specifically, you want about, you want one, at least one mechanical engineer, one electrical engineer, or I guess one M set. But, yeah. uh, and then for a, for uh, beetle weights, it's three to five people each. So, yeah. Questions, questions. Come on, hit me with the hard hitters. So what are we doing like in the, I guess, next uh, meeting and then the following meeting where it's going to start? Do we uh, already start doing something now or? Yeah. You can if you want. I mean, if you want to take the initiative, you want to uh, go go look at these suppliers that I uh, outlined back, or if you want to like start building your building materials. Yeah, yeah. That would okay. be, you would be super far ahead. Um, we're going to be doing okay. that in our workshops, but if you want to give it a shot, uh, I can double check your work. The next meeting is kind of like learning how to make a bill of materials and stuff. Yep. Designing a robot on paper. That's what we're oh, going to awesome. be doing. Um, we might fit some solid works into there. Uh, just some soft skills, stuff like that. Soft oh, introduction. Cool. And the meetings will all be on Friday, like at two usually. 
Uh, we're gonna shift around the time most likely. I gotta visit the dean's office like a few times to annoy them, so that way I could get access to a computer lab. Because once we get access to a computer lab, um, we can just work SolidWorks in there. Because I don't really want you guys to have to use your home computers for SolidWorks. Um, if we could get actual time devoted in the lab for you guys to work on that, that would be perfect. Because I could be right there uh, to like answer any questions. Oh, yeah, guy that'd be great. Nice. Okay. And that'll also you know if we end up assembling a robot that'll be that'll be our time to work on it yeah yeah in person it's like pretty nice cool mark i know you had a question bro i saw you on mute uh, it was mostly about deadlines and stuff. Um, as like an outside external surveyor, I don't really have any questions, but I'm looking forward to see what you guys come up with. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, when's comp? Uh, Chase, when's comp? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What do you mean by a comp uh, comp competition? When? Uh, when's a? Uh... I'm assuming it's scheduled. If not, that's all right. Yes and no. Last year it was a uh, it was in June, and this year they gave us a surprising like a uh, late late April for when it's at. They that said they said it was a tentative deadline, and I expect it to be a lot later in the semester semester for us. You got to remember though they're on the quarter system, so it makes it a tad bit weird when uh. When trying to have it in sync. Gotcha. I'll uh, I'll check in around then then. Uh, beforehand Good. also. Yeah. We will we will be putting an announcement out when we have a solid date as well. <clears throat> but yeah. All right, perfect. Uh, if there's no other questions, you guys are free to go. You made it exactly an hour, pretty much. <laughs>